Hello everybody, I'm David. I'm Naomi. We'll be talking about what you know, we sent to Facebook and some of the work we've been doing lately. And if we get part of the screen off, because we can't see anything at all. Um, so, one of the things we're going to talk about uh, in this particular session is we're going to give you a brief primer about the uh, infrastructure at Facebook, um, and then we're going to talk more specifically about how we're using CentOS at Facebook, but more specifically where we're different than the um, upstream community. And then we'll uh, conclude with a little bit of about how we deploy and manage our fleet, um, but we really want this to be an interactive session, so feel free to like raise hands, ask questions. Um, it's way more interesting and fun uh, when you can actually uh, ask the questions and um, we'll try and answer them as best we can. So let's talk about the infrastructure. We have millions of machines spread around the world. Those are pictures from, I think, Prime Bill Oregon, one of our data centers. Uh, all of these are physical machines. All of these machines run Linux. All of these machines run CentOS, including the top of our switches, because those are also Linux servers running CentOS. Um, all the network, uh, by the way, also, is also entirely on IPv6. So, uh, my team, uh, the operating systems team, is specifically responsible for managing the bare metal experience uh, for the entire fleet. So, we consider the OS to be a platform, and we do a lot of work to uh, help our, the rest of our teams actually consume the resources and uh, options in for, of the operating system. Uh, however, our team does not actually specifically own any of the uh, individual bare metal hosts themselves. So all of the individual teams are responsible for their own hosts, including things like managing maintenances and so on. Uh, but our, we are running 100% uh, oh, like uh, CentOS across our fleet, including on our top of rack switches, uh, which is one of the reasons why we really believe and are completely built on an open source foundation of the Linux, CentOS, RPM, YUM, DNF. Uh, we use Chef for configuration management, and we're pretty heavily involved and invested in systemd. Uh, and we, throughout everything we do, we try to take an absolute first approach, not just in the operating system space, but in the company at large, whenever we engage with the community. We found that oftentimes in this project, the community is the one that sets direction, and you want to work closely with the community to try and understand why people are doing things a certain way and how can that can be useful internally. Uh, we, we want to move really fast to Facebook, but we find that often the community moves even faster. There's always this temptation of working a project early on because you have one little fix you need to get moving and then go on with your life. But we found that if you do that, then you end up paying the cost many, many times later on because people will fix bugs that you found will add new features and you will want those features you know, to backward them in. It is much, much easier to spend the upfront cost of doing all of this work upstream and running the same code that upstream runs so that what you do can benefit everybody else in the world. Also, we don't need to do everything ourselves. There's a lot of problems that the community has already solved that we can just leverage directly. And at the same time, if we share what we built, other people can help maintain it, other people can extend it, other people can build more and better solutions on top of it and that will eventually be beneficial for us as well. Uh, we gave a talk back in 2017 at that conf, talking more in detail about our open source approach and some community examples that you're welcome to watch if you're interested. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing um, and how we're using CentOS at uh, Facebook, but again, focusing a little bit more on where we've uh, kind of differentiated or where we're using something a little differently than the traditional upstream community. Um, specifically, we... Uh, like using CentOS because we have stable releases. Um, we also really rely on the binary compatibility and the API compatibility for uh, the packages, um, as well as making sure that we stay close to the security updates. There's a lot of really mature and well understood tooling around the CentOS environment and operating system. Um, but we also bring in Apple and use that for some of the other ad hoc packages that our developers or other um, service owners really need. Um, we have a pretty close relationship with Fedora, and there are a number of packages that will actually um, continue to use from that, uh, from the upstream Fedora community. And this is actually a good example, and what we end up doing to be able to move fast, as fast as we need to, but still on a stable base, is that we take a thin layer of backwards from Fedora, usually, for the parts that we want to follow closely. So we have projects like SystemD where we 
do a lot of development work upstream. So we will take the packaging from Fedora and rebuild those versions internally. Uh, by the way, the packaging is on GitHub on that GitHub if you're interested. Uh, we try to write this in a way that they are, they are useful also, not just to us, so that all the pixel specific config stuff is gated to the macro. So if you build it outside, you don't get our entity service and stuff like that, because that wouldn't be very helpful. Um, and we do this mostly for plumbing and low level stuff. Uh, but we try to keep this as small as possible. We, we very much want to be able to leverage the upstream work and the upstream packaging as much as possible. Uh, doing this internally has a cost. Uh, partly because you need to build the packages and everything, but also you have to maintain it, you have to take care of security updates, you have to worry about, oh, upstream actually did break binary combat in this place, and then you need to backport and work around it. So when we can, we would very much prefer to be able to keep using the versions available in Sandbox. Uh, our kernel is the one I actually, the primary areas where we are a little different than the upstream um, community. We try to stay as close as possible. We do have a group of kernel engineers, however, that develop our um, Facebook internal kernel. Uh, they do a lot of development and masters, so uh, we like to make sure that we have enough uh, that they can go ahead and pull in some of those features that they are currently developing and deploy those rapidly across our fleet. Um, some of the primary examples and things that we have actually really contributed to and have actually implemented in our own kernels are using ButterFS, um, Cgroups2, uh, PSI, and eBPF. We have a lot of investment inside of these spaces and tooling. So, and these are all things that we have core developers working at Facebook and doing a lot of work upstream for these things, and these are all things that have been merged relatively well. Some of these have been on for a while, but feature development of DC is ongoing upstream on the kernel side, and these are all things we want to be able to use internally as much as possible. Yep. So we have a blog, um, and this is right here, where we talk a little bit more about uh, these particular areas um, inside of the Linux kernel and um, some of the things that we're doing around that. Yeah, uh, and we also have uh, automation for managing kernel rollouts in the fleet, mm -hmm. uh, so that any tier owners and service owners at Facebook are able to say, okay, I have these many machines, I know I can take this much of an outage, and I'm taking a kernel request or reboot, as you all know. Uh, so they're able to, to do the reboots and the updates at the pace they're comfortable with without affecting the service. And this has the advantage that from the kernel team standpoint, they can get newer kernels onto the fleet very quickly. Uh, which is beneficial. Uh, so people get new features, the kernel team is happy because they get new kernels deployed and everything is good in the world. Mm -hmm. um, on the system front, uh, as I said, we do a lot of development upstream and we have a backward tracking upstream development on the GitHub repo. Uh, right now we're running 243 on almost everywhere in the fleet. Uh, we are in the process of rolling out 244, I believe it's in the areas of today. Um, we generally try to track the latest table of stable minus one, give or take. Uh, we have a CACD pipeline that every day at 10 a.m. grabs the latest git master from the systemd repo, builds it, runs a few tests on it, drops it on a few machines, so we can get early signal on potential breakage, potential incompatibility changes that landed. Uh, this has been very, very useful, um, and it has let us discover a number of things way before release time that we were able to communicate to upstream and get sorted out early on. Uh, we also do a lot of feature development work on system D itself. Uh, I won't go in detail on this because we've done many talks on this in the past. One of them is linked there, but if you're interested, by all means, feel free to ask questions. Uh, there's a few projects we maintain within the system D ecosystem. Uh, we maintain a set of compa libraries that let you run a modern system D on CentOS 7. CentOS 7 upstream ships with 2.19. Uh, 2.19 was before they did the library split, because system D changed the, how the libraries are laid out. So if you use our compa libraries, you don't have to say recompile Apache, which is Nice, because we'd rather not be in the business of recompiling Apache, we really don't have to. <coughs> um, we also maintain a set of Python bindings. Uh, these are Python bindings being built against the C uh, libraries that are made available by systemd. Uh, these are very useful, in particular, if you need to talk to something over Dbus, <coughs> because they give you a thin tracker on top of SDBus, which is the library that's part of systemd, uh, which is very useful if you need to write code that is talking to systemd from Python in a, in a performant way. We uh, use network scripts across the entire fleet at uh, Facebook. Um, we are actually one of the maintainers of uh, network scripts, and there are a few reasons why we do this. Uh, one of them is specifically around uh, the hook support. Uh, the upstream network manager and um, actually network scripts themselves really do a lot of work to try and help make sure that the, um, the default behavior is very safe. And so for things like interface changes or general configuration changes, one of the behaviors is to go ahead and restart the network service uh, rather, you know, 
on any type of change. Uh, we need a little more fine grain control than that. There are some types of changes that can go ahead and happen that we don't necessarily need to restart the interface. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, on a fleet our size, there are <laughs> some dangers if you want to go ahead and just allow it to continue to do that behavior. Yeah, if you have a machine serving user request and you bounce the network under it, the service will not be particularly happy. If you do this on all the machines in the service at once, the owners of the service will definitely not be happy. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of changes that you might want to do to network configuration are not actually changes that require a network to start. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have the ability, especially via Chef and the configuration management, to do things like, okay, you ask us to change the MTU on this interface. That doesn't actually require a bounce. So I will update the config file on the disk and then run the sequence of IF config commands that will do the right thing and validate that did the right thing without bouncing the interface. And this is one of the things that is made very easy by using something like network scripts uh, because it's very easy to understand what the script is doing because it's, well, it's bash. Uh, so when things go wrong, we can run with bash dash x and see what exactly is going on there. Mm -hmm. um, so we definitely really appreciate also the troubleshooting aspects that yeah. we get from um, the network scripts. And also we've been doing quite a bit of feature development and some bug fixes, uh, specifically around uh, IPv6 support and so on. Um, on the packaging side, we use the standard Red Hat packaging stack, so we use RPM and DNF and YUM. Uh, we found over the years a number of challenges around running RPM scale, especially related to the RPM database. The RPM database uh, nowadays is BerkeleyDB. Uh, BerkeleyDB is interesting in that, among other things, it requires taking a write log even when you're reading. And if you have multiple concurrent operations and the, on the database, it, there's a very high chance of corruption. Uh, we can reliably get BerkeleyDB corruption on a sizable portion of our fleet on a per minute basis. So to mitigate this problem, we wrote a tool called DCRPM that essentially looks at machines with corruption and hooks the database in various ways to make it useful and uncorrupted. This is on GitHub. Uh, you are welcome to use it if you'd like. It runs on Linux and on OS X because we have the pleasure of also running RPM on OS X. Um, but this doesn't actually fix the problem because the corruption is still there. So upstream has been doing for a while work on um, other potential backend alternatives from BDB. Uh, there are two backends merged upstream right now. One is LMDB, one is NDB, and there is a new SQL-like backend in development. Uh, we spent the better portion of the last year doing A-B testing between LMDB and NDB, and we ended up rolling NDB on the fleet everywhere. So right now we run NDB on every machine at Facebook, and we have zero instances of corruption, uh, which is quite nice. And we're actually phasing out the DCRPM, the uses of DCRPM, because it's no longer necessary. Um, upstream RPM is working on the SQL Lite backend that should have uh, similar reliability guarantees, but it looks like it's going to be a little easier to maintain. Uh, so we're going to start A-B testing that too once it becomes available. We've also done a lot of feature development in this space. Uh, on the RPM side, we merged a few changes early on uh, to have more fine grain control on f on writes, uh, which is useful for some, some of our workloads. We're also playing, uh, experimenting, we leveraging copy and write properties of file systems uh, like RFS and see if we can use that to speed up package installs. Um, this is work that isn't published yet, uh, but we are hoping to have something that we can contribute soon. On the YAM side, we have a plugin for YAM that uses BitTorrent um, to download files because you have a lot of machines, BitTorrent kind of helps. Uh, this is important to DNF, but hopefully we will port it to DNF soon. Uh, we've also contributed a few changes to the patch cleanup and other tools in your mutuals in the past. Mm -hmm. um, around uh, how we provision our machines at Facebook is all of our hosts are net booted. Um, and what we do, um, for CentOS 5 and 6, we used Anaconda as our installer, but for CentOS 7 and moving forward, we're actually using an image based installer. Uh, one of the reasons why we moved to the image based installer was because of some of the integrations that we could leverage for things like uh, firmware management, um, as well as um, using the existing container build system and uh, actually take some of our chef code that allows us to use the uh, logic that's running during the life of the machine to actually build the system image that we will then use for provisioning and um, rolling out. Yeah, this installer isn't open source, uh, yeah. partly because it's fairly intertwined with policy decisions and things that are Facebook specific, partly because it isn't terribly interesting, because most of what it's doing is taking a pre-built image DD on the R drive and installing Grub, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't exactly rocket science.
Um, on the container side, uh, over the years, more and more workloads we found have been moving over to containers. That has actually been one of the main changes we have seen uh, between when we were moving from 6 to 7 and now moving from 7 to 8. Um, we, at Facebook, we have our own internally built container manager thing. Uh, we don't use Docker, we don't use Kubernetes, primarily because when we started writing our thing, none of these existed, so we kind of stuck with it. Over the years, uh, we've been looking at opportunities for leveraging more and more community tooling in there, so we started partly on features we directly work on, so our container manager extensively uses resource control features provided by uh, Secret2. It extensively leverages ButterFS and Sandstreams, for example, uh, but we also looked at swapping pieces out with pieces that are available in the community that are more useful and easier to maintain. So, for example, we've been working on integrating systemd more and more, and nowadays we actually use systemd Anspawn at the image build stage, and we use the, the container agent itself, we'll talk to systemd using the Divas interface on the box. Uh, there's a blog post on this uh, that you can read if you're more interested. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we uh, deploy and manage our hosts at Facebook and um, the entire fleet. So, uh, like we said before, we use Chef for configuration management, if you're familiar with Ansible, Puppet, uh, so on. Uh, this provides a very similar type of experience where we write uh, some policy uh, and then we continue to enforce it um, on our hosts. Uh, we actually use Chef a little differently and have a slightly different model than uh, most other uh, people who have implemented Chef at their organizations. Uh, we've got a, a doc that outlines a bit of our philosophy, but the key components are that we have layered-based configuration uh, through attribute-based APIs. What this means is that my team can go ahead, write some APIs for interacting with the system level tunables, and then set some same defaults that, because we work with the upstream CentOS community, we say, this makes sense as a general rule for our fleet. However, the individual service owners and the people who actually run those specific hosts can say, but for my particular service, I need to make sure that I've set this syscuttle or I have these types of uh, default set for the file system and so on. So, but what this allows us to do is to go ahead and have the separation of the policy and the mechanism. When a person or an engineer sets that uh, configuration um, um, value, it goes ahead and just applies for that one specific value. They don't have to try and then become the expert on the rest of the tunables that would be in that system control file. Um, and so this uh, makes, <laughs> essentially my engineers just need to go ahead and understand how to assign values to keys in a hash, and that makes it pretty easy for them. Um, Chef is also idempotent, and that's really important. Um, obviously, we don't need to be continually making sure that we're attempting to reinstall packages, uh, but it also gives us the ability to have configuration as programming. Uh, we have context and we have um, information around why changes are made and why the system is configured the way that it is. Uh, we also spend a lot of time really invested in the Chef upstream community. Um, in similar ways that we are here working with the CentOS community, we've also done that with Chef. Um, we have a number of tools that we have written, um, and so you can see we have a couple examples here on like our Chef Utils, our Chef Cookbooks. We also have a bunch of other tools um, for actually delivering content, testing uh, in our a particular Facebook model and so on. So if you have questions around that, feel free to step there or ask us. Uh, on the operating system side, there's generally two major events that we might do. There's major operating system version upgrades, so if you go from 6 to 7 or 7 to 8, and minor upgrades. Uh, for major upgrades, we don't do in-place updates. We always wipe and provision the machines. We do this for a few reasons. So historically, you couldn't really do in-place updates at all. It wasn't a supported option. Uh, so when we did 5 to 6, we kind of had to do this. But we still like to continue doing this uh, because it gives us the chance to start from a clean slate. And starting from a clean slate is very, very nice because on one side it means you don't need to worry about queer one-time quirks of the upgrade process itself. On the other, it gives us the chance of doing more things together with the updates. We, can, we have the ability to deprecate features we don't want that maybe we had before but were not entirely desirable. We have the ability to couple policy changes. Uh, and we can also use the maintenance window that comes up when you reimage a machine to do other things. 
So for example, when we did 6 to 7, one big change was the move from uh, Sys5 to systemd. Uh, turns out that Facebook, we had like five or six different ways of doing service supervision written in-house with varying levels of quality and levels of supportedness. Uh, we didn't really want to keep that baggage on with 7, uh, so we just said, okay, when you move to 7, you're going to have to rewrite all of these and just use systemd. And that, that was painful initially, but it made for a much better product in the end for people. Uh, for 7 to 8, uh, one thing we're doing is that we are giving the default that people get is that they get a machine with other effects on slash uh, because we would like to be able to leverage a lot of the new resource control features that only work with other effects. Uh, we are also defaulting machines to SIGGRUP 2 and we're actually not going to support SIGGRUP 1 internally at all uh, because we like resource control that actually works. Um, as part of the maintenance of Windows, we'll often apply firmware upgrades and other, other machine specific things that are useful to do at the same time. Um, and we have tooling for this. So the same tooling we mentioned before for kernel upgrades, we use it for operating system upgrades. So one is the ability to say, on this fleet, I know how long it takes for my machines to go out of service. I can do these upgrades at a rate I'm comfortable with. And especially if your service is stateless, this is effectively fire and forget. If your service is, if your service is stateful, there's a more considerations because you might have like oh, the rack of cat pictures. You can only take them so many at the same time, or you don't have cat pictures anymore. For the minor uh, OS upgrades, we do uh, incremental rolling OS upgrades. So what this means is that we go ahead and we sync, uh, sync down the repos uh, about every two weeks, the upstream CentOS repos and um, Apple. And then we slowly roll this out across the entire fleet. So how this works is we have uh, a little API and tool that we wrote inside of our FEM cookbook. Um, we don't actually open source this particular component yet, but it's pretty simple. Uh, essentially what it does is it goes ahead and it looks at are you in scope for this particular segment of the rollout, sorry, part of the 1% that is getting this, these changes today. And it will go ahead and add those repos to the configuration file and then it will go ahead and do that update during the, um, its chef run. And then it slowly continues to roll out to more and more hosts over two weeks. Um, we have high level monitoring of that particular rollout health um, because we don't have the ability, or we rely on the upstream community to make sure that, um, to comply with the ABI compatibility and make sure that this is consistent. Uh, we don't have the ability or desire to hand check every single package that gets updated in that rolling repo or that rolling update. So uh, we test and prod, and we will see what breaks uh, in some of the yes. smaller um, segments or it's the smaller rollout groups. Yeah, it's but worth noting that usually what breaks is dollar engineer installed <laughs> some fringe XOR package on their development machine and then tried to load KDE and discovered that that doesn't quite work as well anymore. And that's not really something we're supporting internally anyway, so it's not that big of an issue. But in the event we do find something that is uh, having some significant impacts on our fleet or on a particular service, we do have a really easy stop button for the whole process, as well as being able to opt out specific individual packages from either the entire um, rollout and upgrade or for specific uh, hosts and uh, services. So where are we now? Uh, right now, most of our fleet is on Sun7. Uh, we are in the process of rolling out uh, what we internally call CentOS 8, because names are hard, but it's actually CentOS Stream. Uh, we are rolling out CentOS Stream instead of CentOS 8 for a few reasons. Uh, in, right now, CentOS Stream gives us a much easier workflow for handling rolling device updates. Because Stream is a rolling distribution by design, it's a lot easier for us to just snapshot the repos entirely every two weeks, instead of having to do the dance where we get stuff on the updates repo, the mercy back, and so on. But what we're really excited about for Stream is the ability to contribute more of our work upstream and get more of the work that is currently either internal or squared away in GitHub repos in the actual distribution so that it can be useful to more people within the CentOS community. Uh, internally, we have CentOS 7 targeted uh, to be uh, EOL'd by the end of the year. Uh, we see how that actually works in practice, uh, but right now we have, I checked the numbers before, and we have, two, as of today, we have about 3,000 boxes running stream, uh, and it's climbing up fairly rapidly. Um, I gave a talk just this week uh, at DEF CONF about the migration process itself. Uh, the videos isn't out yet, but I'll leave the slides there. I'm also happy to answer questions if you have any. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's pretty much what we have. Please ask questions. We are happy to answer any you might have. Yes? 
Hi, thank, thanks for the talk, very nice. So on the major OS upgrades, mm -hmm. one, one of the things you said, you leverage a general host maintenance window, but before you had said that the teams own their machines, mm -hmm. like you provide this base layer. Correct. So do you like agree at time of the week to say, you these two hours every week, those are ours? How do you engage uh, with the teams? So the question is, how do we handle maintenance windows and whether it's a standard maintenance windows that people agree on? Uh, yes and no. So what we have now is that, generally speaking, there isn't a set maintenance windows. It's up to every team to figure out what cadence they're comfortable with, and there are different types, different tools they can use to manage these maintenances. Uh, there are teams that do a very good job at this. There are teams that do a very bad job at this. Uh, there are also teams that own single-digit numbers of machines. There are teams that own seven-digit numbers of machines. So to put things in context, it very much depends. There is an ongoing effort internally to try and standardize this a bit more, especially for some specific types of workflows where it makes sense. Uh, but right now, it's mostly up to individual owners to, to do this. And to be clear, by maintenance window, I mean that, say, you run the cat picture service. You know that to take down a machine in the cat picture service, you need to like send an RPC request and wait a bunch of time so it's drained. So you do that, then you do your maintenance, then you do the opposite to put it back in production. So that's, and there is a standard interface for doing this kind of stuff. That's it. Like, it's important to continue to remember that, like, the, it's the individual host or service owners who can actually uh, dictate some of this uh, process. So, for example, with the cat service, uh, perhaps it's only okay if two of their hosts go away at a time, um, but they're the ones who know that two can go. Yep. And like, they need to make sure like what up or what healthy looks like for them before the next two can go. It's not something that like a global team like ourselves would say, we are going to tell you that we're going to take 10 and you only have 11, um, yeah. that kind of thing. If you don't do anything for a long time, people will start getting very obnoxious because to please get your shit together, okay. but generally that isn't necessary. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, so, so you said that you uh, deploy your updates uh, over uh, a time period of two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and then monitor progress of the deployment, but I assume also of the stability of the deployment? That's correct. Um, how are you managing that? Because I, especially um, compared to application updates, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, and reinstalls and... So the question is, how do we manage the, the monitoring the deployment of minor running OS updates throughout the fleet? Um, so, we, there's a few things here. We generally use the, the chef succeeding on a machine as a proxy for general health of the machine. Because if chef, chef succeeds, it means the updates were actually installed successfully and the services that are supposed to be running are still running. We also have a lot of application specific monitoring that we can use. So when we start rolling this out on 1% of the fleet, say, it will go on 1% of the container management system. And the container management system says really good tooling and monitoring that can advise us if things go wrong. The database system is the same. Um, and we do this in a way that the initial rollout is on a portion that isn't service impacted. So if, if we end up completely destroying a small percentage of the fleet, that is unfortunate, but that's not something you're going to notice as a user, so it, it is fine. Um, and that's the only actual way we have to do these things, because we don't have, we don't have like a test cluster or a test data center. Uh, we do have canary groups, uh, but canary groups are generally just production systems of peak to be very varied, so you can get better signal from them. Mm -hmm. I think one of the important things is that like this is a canary groups that are selected not necessarily by um, arbitrary service, like we're going to upgrade over the databases first or anything like that. It is effectively one percent that is. A shard generated off of arbitrary thing like the host name and so on um, of the host so we can get a really good cross-section that allows us to say it is 1% of the entire fleet not 1% of the service do was there yep. something else going on inside of that service um, and so that allows us to at least abstract away from the rest of the changes that are constantly rolling up across the entire fleet and going on in these hosts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And just the question of kernel rollout is a great. Do you manage those through Chef as well? So it's at least the people can choose the kernel they want in Chef and then um, magic happens as they're young with downgrade and things like that? Or? Uh, 
Mm, I don't think we manage kernel versions of themselves in Chef. We do manage graph configuration in Chef. Uh, if I remember correctly, for the kernel specifically, what we use is that we use the upgrade tooling. The upgrade tooling essentially SSHs into machines and uh, runs a tool that, among other things, will install the kernel that is desired and then force a chef run to get uh, the graph config regenerated. Um, I guess we could manage this in chef. Uh, it, this is, um, I think this is just something that hasn't come up before and there wasn't, because the kernel is not something you can update online anyway, because you need to reboot the box. It's reasonable enough to do it this way. Because um, otherwise, you would need to do the orchestration the other way around, where you could do the update from Chef, but then Chef would need to signal the external system that he would like to reboot, and then you need to orchestrate that. And we do have a way to do that as well, but uh, that we started doing kernel upgrades way before we had that system available. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes? Do you find that there's other packages like GWC that you have to deploy together with the kernel every single time? Or is it, have you managed to disconnect? I, I have put a veto on the patches and things on GBC actually. Uh, we will always, throughout the lifetime of the distros, especially towards the end, we will get people that are like, oh my god, I really need GBC 228 or whatever, the new one is that isn't the one in the distro, because whatever. And the general policy is no, we will not backward glibc from Fedora or do anything crazy like that uh, because, well, partly because we don't have the manpower to do it. Also because I personally think it's a really bad idea uh, to swap such a core component of the system. Uh, what we tell people is that they can build against our internal glibc uh, because at Facebook there are two trains. There is the system train and there's the Facebook train. The system train is you build against the system glibc, the system compiler, the system tool, and you write system tools. The Facebook train is you build against the glibc that the compilers did maintain and the compiler that the compilers did maintain. And you get your binaries technically linked and then you, they link against something in user, the user will open epic code or whatever. Um, and that's what we tell people to do. Or if you're writing Facebook specific application software that's never going to be open source, please use that. And then the compilers team can help you and get all the features you want. Um, this generally comes up when people are like, oh, but I need to do, say, Android development. And the last version of the Android SDK needs this new TLC or any torrent Yocto or whatever. Um, so far, we've been able to, luckily, the distribution updates are frequent enough that we've been able to tell people, OK, you need this now. We're going to have send date in a month. Can you hold for a month and we will just give you send date and you can be at the beta tester there? Uh, that has worked remarkably OK so far. Um, but yeah, that is a concern. Um, I actually had someone asking me the other day if I could put a patch in video bills. And also a bad thing. Yes. Uh, I'm curious to hear how. So you give a nice presentation on how you actually manage the fleet through configuration management and uh, other tools. But you also mentioned that you, for certain uh, workloads, you use containers. How how is your experience um, managing those two? Like, are those two separate worlds, or do you kind of like? Try to combine and manage them the same way. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? The question is how uh, how does containers and configuration management interplay together? I believe this is your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are a couple things. Uh, we allow the people who are going to be moving into the containers to kind of customize their experience. There are places where it makes sense for them to, uh, like we were talking about with our installer process, um, where we can use Chef to go ahead and uh, generate that container or that image that will go ahead and um, actually be used for the systems. They can also do that for their containers. Um, so there are groups that will use the existing Chef logic as they begin to migrate over into the new container world to actually build their container images and like our base image for that um, container to actually launch. Uh, we also have uh, the ability for them to go ahead and run our configuration management inside of their container if that is a thing that they need to do. Um, we also like to facilitate them not doing that and continuing to redeploy and relaunch their containers very, very frequently. But there are some different types of workload, different types of services, um, especially while we start to or continue to transition. Yeah. So, so if I understood correctly, you you generate the containers through Chef. Yes. But you kind of treat them like OS level containers in the sense that. 
like, yeah, like everything is complicated. Yeah. So the, <laughs> it depends. Some things will treat containers as the base image plus these three packages and a statically linked binary that needs to run. Mm -hmm. Those are very easy. Those don't need any kind of config management. They are hopefully redeployed very frequently. All is good in the world. The other extent of the spectrum is a team that treats containers as machines, where they SSH into them and do stuff to them. Those run Chef every 15 minutes uh, and are effectively treated as machines, and they run as complex of a Chef setup as you might find on a host. Mm -hmm. uh, the in-between state might be a team that had a pre-existing setup on bare metal, wants to move into containers, so they use some of their existing recipes to build their base image, but they also have a little bit of random configuration they need to be continuously applied. Or say a team that needs to, I don't know, a team that needs uh, LDAP access from within their container for some reason, in, in which case the supportive way to do that by this LDAP team is to use SSSD and the LDAP tooling that is managed by Chef. So in that case, they would want to run Chef at least to get that. Um, in general, I would, I think from our side, we would prefer people not to run Chef inside containers and just redeploy their images very quickly, because that, that is a better life for everybody, but there's always a sliding spectrum of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely leverage a lot of systemd, um, so like people will go ahead and, you know, using Chef to go ahead and generate those uh, unit files, they're dropped off in the image, they're enabled, but not started. And then on, you know, container startup, that actually starts to take over and do a lot of the work that would previously been done um, with Chef. Yes? Are you guys looking into some alternatives to network scripts uh, for future use? Uh, alternatives, you mean? Well, so, different tools. Oh, the question is if well, what we're doing for network scripts and if we're looking at alternatives or other tools. So right now we are we're going to keep using network scripts for the lifecycle of eight. Uh, I don't think there's any major development planned on network scripts itself. Although I did see I have one bug that I filed that I need to actually fix. Uh, well, we fixed it internally. I just need to abstain the patch. And there are a few PRs that are abstaining that I want to make sure get backported. Uh, and I'll actually try to get possible into, into stream because uh, they will help prevent grief for people. Uh, for the 8 plus 1 cycle, uh, we are thinking about it. Uh, on one side, I think we would like to keep running network scripts if possible because there's a lot of tooling and stuff built around it. On the other, we recognize the fact that if the world at large moves on, we should also move on at some point. Uh, one option is to reevaluate network manager, one option is to evaluate network D. We haven't really committed one way or another. What I suspect will happen is that sometime, maybe this year, maybe next year, someone will start looking at this and will eventually make a decision. Um, I think the important part, though, is that like with a lot of these different projects, the things that we care about are the fine grain control. Yeah. Um, you know, when you run with this much scale, uh, there are various areas of concern that we have, and one of them is looking at the individual configurables. And there are a lot of default settings that are makes sense for the community at large, but for us, we really need to make sure that we can have all of the really minor efficiency wins, because that's actually a big impact for us. So whether it's you know being able to change individual components or you know, settings on an interface and not restarting the network, that's a really key thing for us. So yeah. we need to make sure that we have that functionality moving forward. The other concern is whatever we end up using, it needs to be something we can be comfortable doing development on and maintaining, because this is something we will need to, not frequently, but like on a certain cadence, either patch or whatever. Uh, and like network scripts is easy because it's bash. Uh, network manager is written in G object, uh, which we do not have any internal expertise on. Uh, network is written in C and is part of system D. So from that point of view, network would probably be a better option for us. Uh, but as I said, we haven't really properly evaluated any of these yet. Uh, was a hand somewhere before. Yes. Uh, you said you don't know your users to use hashes and keys to change uh, chef configuration, mm -hmm. right? How are you managing that? Do you accept the changes that they use? Do that? Can they write chef manifests? Or yeah. do you manage the code? Uh, uh, anyone can change anything without any uh, level of approval of like, or acceptance? Or? So there is code review on Facebook. Uh, the question is how does change management work for chef? Uh, there is uh, code review on Facebook. So you need at least one other engineer to sign up on what you're doing. There are different levels of the code base that are quite different levels of code review. So for Chef specifically, there is uh, strict, this isn't entirely true, but it's simplified enough for these, the purposes of this conversation. There is the core set and the other set. 
The core set is stuff that our team maintains and provides basic APIs. So think about the API to configure the network, the API to define syscalls. If you want to make changes to the implementation of how we configure syscalls on the machine, you will need to get code review from us or you won't be able to land your change in production. But if you work on the databases and you want to change a syscall on your systems and you're just using the API, you don't need to go through us. Like you're welcome to ask us and we'll give you a code review, but if all you're doing is I want to change VM swappiness on my set of machines. You can totally do that on your own. Um, what's also worth saying is if then later on you decide, oh, I actually didn't want to change VM swappiness and you will remove that setting, if, because of this, the way this layer configuration works, Chef will put you back on the default that we have defined. Um, there is a talk uh, that uh, was given a long time ago about how Chef works at Facebook, which is still mostly accurate, that you can find on YouTube if you search for Chef Facebook. Uh, there is also a philosophy document you can find on GitHub that I link from the slides uh, that goes over how this works. Mm -hmm. um, and gives some examples of yeah. how it's consumed and so on. Any yeah. other? Yes? So for the top of red switches, you, you said you, all your fleet is seven, sent to seven, mm -hmm. and you're going to send those eight streams mm -hmm. on the top of red switches as well. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting because we only have one top of red switch. Oh, the question is, uh, what about the top of red switches? Are you going to do eight there? Yes. Um, uh, the top of red switch is weird. So the, the way racks work is that there's one top of red switch and there's a bunch of machines. If the top of red switch goes down, the whole rack loses connectivity. So as you might imagine, if you do an OS upgrade on a top of red switch, the rack loses connectivity for a while. Uh, so that makes upgrade coordination challenging. <laughs> uh, but yes, we do, we do expect to get eight. Um, or well, stream on all the top of our switches at some point. Um, my hunch is that they will probably be part of the long tail because of how this works. Uh, but yes, that is that is the intent. Uh, top of our switches at Facebook are servers. They're they're no different than normal servers. Um, the, and the design for the top of our switches, by the way, open source and part of open compute. If you're interested in. Questions? Going once, going twice.